Is it working? Yeah, please proceed. Okay. We are now at about the 40 hour mark of the liberal obstruction of the ethics committee. 40 hours of obstruction represents uh, an unprecedented interference and in democratic accountability. 40 hours uh, translated would have been 20 meetings, 20 meetings to gather witness testimony, to prepare reports, to move on to other issues. And yet the Liberals have decided to shut down the work of this committee. Now, some people might not think the Ethics Committee is a committee that people pay much attention to. And certainly we've had Liberals come in and say, nobody cares what happens here. But one of the fundamental features of the Ethics Committee, it is it's one of the checks and balance committees. It is why it has always had an opposition chair. So contrary to the misinformation by Liberals that this committee exists to help the Ethics Commissioner, that this committee is there to somehow, you know, uh, review just doc, uh, um, just to review laws and make sure everything's good and easy, straightforward for the government. This is actually a check and balance committee, which is why oppositions always chair it. So the decision by the Prime Minister's office to shut down this committee is telling. I say this because uh, the stories for why the Liberals are obstructing our committee continually changes. But last week it became uh, crystal clear once we got past their arguments about boxer shorts and underwear and PPE and gloves and everything else, they were very clear. They said an investigation into the conflict of interest uh, dealings on this pandemic was a direct attack on great Canadians, great Canadian charities, and great businesses. So this morning, I'm going to look into one of those great businesses that they're protecting, Palantir. Uh, Palantir Canada's mission statement, we're bringing cutting edge Silicon Valley technology to the most important government institutions in Canada. So how did they set out to make those connections with government? Well, they hired one of the top liberal insiders as their president. Mr. David McNaughton, uh, who's as close to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau as you can get, much closer than the Kielberger brothers. He co-chaired Justin Trudeau's election campaign. And as liberals always do, they give great benefits to their buddies. So Mr. McNaughton was given pretty much an unprecedented gift in making him ambassador to, to the United States, which I think we'd agree is our most important trading partner. Mr. McNaughton came back from his work representing us and began to open doors into the inner workings of the Liberal government for the company Palantir. Meetings with Krista Friedland, meetings with Navdeep Baines, meetings right into the Prime Minister's office with the Prime Minister's uh, close, confident Rick Tice. So what is Palantir? I think this is something that Canadians really need to know because they need to know who it is that the Liberals are allowing in the back door. So now Peter Thiel founded this company uh, and he is a very, I think, disturbing public figure. In 2009, April 13th, 2009, he wrote a statement and he says, I no longer believe that freedom and democracy are compatible. Peter Thiel is an extreme libertarian billionaire who has made it clear that he does not believe in democracy. This is one of the great companies that the liberals uh, want to protect. Now, BBC has described Palantir as the quote, scariest of America's tech giants. And why is that? Well, we'll get into that. Uh, but I'd like to talk also about Mr. Thiel and his connections to the extreme and the extremist right in the United States. I refer you to the article in The Public in June 2018, where it says Peter Thiel, a Stanford grad and Silicon Valley billionaire, uh, is notable for his far right wing libertarian views. Thiel first came to national attention when he gave a primetime speech at the 2016 Republican Convention supporting Donald Trump. 
virtually the only Silicon Valley entrepreneur to back Trump. Now, PayPal made Thiel a multimillionaire and his early investments in Facebook in 2004 made him a billionaire. He's invested in companies like LinkedIn, Lyft, Spotify, Reddit, Airbnb, and SpaceX. But it's his work in establishing Palantir with the CIA um, in targeting insurgents in Iraq that created this technology that is now being used in the United States on its own citizens. So one of Palantir's co-founders is John Lonsdale, and I think uh, my colleagues in the Liberals will be interested in him too, because this is another one of the great people that they feel that I am somehow attacking by asking for an investigation into how this company managed to get right into the Deputy Prime Minister's office. So Lonsdale uh, was a protege of Teal, and um, he was banned from campus at Stanford in 2014, this is according to the public June 2018, uh, that he was banned from campus in 2014 after he was accused of rape and Stanford concluded he'd engaged in sexual misconduct and harassment. I'm giving that a direct quote because I don't know the facts of the case myself. In October 2016, a week after Trump's famous Hollywood access tape was released in which he bragged about grabbing women's um, private parts, Teal contributed 1.25 million to the campaign of Trump. And at the same time, Teal, and this is again from the public June 2018, apologized for saying things in his book, the diversity of myths, such as that alleged date rapes were, quote, seductions that are later regretted. I think for a government that ties himself on being the feminist prime minister and the feminist uh, government, such a comment, I think, is really, really concerning. Now, what's interesting is that uh, Mr. Thiel uh, made a public statement that he apologized for making these comments about date rape. He said, more than two decades ago, I co-wrote a book with sense several insensitive, crudely argued statements. And as I've said before, I wish I'd never written those things. I'm sorry for it. Rape in all forms is a crime. I re regret writing passages that have taken that have been taken to suggest otherwise. And I'm very pleased that Mr. Thiel said it. People do grow up and change their views. But according to the article in the public, three months later, that a 30-year-old anniversary for the Stanford Review, Thiel said, uh, told one former editor his, quote, apology was just for the media. It's sometimes you have to tell them what they hear. So Donald Trump gets elected. And Peter Thiel and his so-called buddy network are huge in the transition. It was said that he was deeply involved in all the transitions in our internal workings and that his fingerprints are all over the administration. And many of the San Francisco employees started calling him the shadow president. So this is the company that the liberals have blocked our work from doing shining any light into. I'll refer you to September 11th, uh, 2020 BuzzFeed article, Peter Thiel met with the racist fringe as he went in all out for Trump. And that article talks about how he held uh, a dinner uh, for uh, influential, vocal white white nationalists, uh, extremist white nationalists um, in the United States. I find that very concerning. So what does this have to do with Canada? Well, Palantir's specialty is... Uh, the data mining that they established working for the CIA. Uh, in fact, the CIA was one of their first uh, investors through its venture capital arm in QTEL. Yes, CIA has a venture capital arm. And it was Palantir's only customer for years as the company refined and improved its uh, technology. By 2010, Palantir's customers were mostly government agencies, though there were some private companies uh, in the mix. Uh, at, by 2015, Palantir was valued at $20 billion. Now, the intercept Sam Biddle, who's covered Palantir for years, says, I think it's worth keeping in mind that Palantir sees itself not alongside Uber, Twitter, and Netflix, but alongside Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, and Booz Allen. Palantir wants to be a defense contractor. Now, 
what we've been told in the accusations against Palantir specialty is that they are, quote, a monstrous government snoop. Palantir's work, the government agencies that contracted, and the relative lack of details about the company's inner workings, uh, this is from a Voxcom article, I mean, it's often seen as a secretive, all-knowing, and even malevolent organization. Uh, Bloomberg ran a really interesting article on them called Palantir Knows Everything About You. Uh, and in a book with the phrase destroying democracy in the title, Robert Shear called Palantir a monstrous government snoop, mining our most intimate data. The company's software has been criticized for its dragnet ways, pulling in records of millions of innocent people so it can catch a few possible uh, criminals. Palantir's data mining software is used to analyze vast amounts of personal data held by the federal government to make determinations that affect people's lives with little or no oversight, says Jeremy D. Scott, senior counsel for the Electronic Privacy Information Center, which successfully sued Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, to get records on its work with Palantir. So I would think that Deputy Minister Friedland, given her intense uh, knowledge of the international market, would know exactly who she was dealing with when she invited Palantir into her office. She would know that there were major human rights violations uh, that had been levied against Palantir. And yet the liberals on this committee do not want us to make those connections to Deputy Minister Friedland and this company Palantir. But I would ask them, I would beg them uh, to stop talking about underwear uh, at our committee and actually maybe read the 2020 Amnesty International report on Palantir. The Amnesty wrote a damning article about how Palantir's technology, technology that was, was created during the war of terror that was created in Iraq and in the battlefields of Afghanistan to target citizens and people in the United States. And who did they target? Well, through the police, they target racialized communities, uh, and they targeted immigrant families. And this is what Michael Kleinman, the director of Amnesty International Silicon Valley Initiative says, Palantir touts its ethical commitments, saying it will never work with regimes that abuse human rights abroad. This is deeply ironic, given the company's willingness stateside to work directly with ICE which has used its technology to execute harmful policies that target migrants and asylum seekers. We could close our eyes and pretend that contrary to all the evidence, Palantir is a rights respecting company, or we can call this facade for what it is, another company placing profit over people, no matter what the human cost. So on September 10th, 2010, this is not very long ago, I, I urge my liberal colleagues uh, while they're filibustering to actually Google some of this stuff so they we can maybe talk about this instead of uh, all the prevarications they're making at our committee. But on September 10th, Amnesty International sent a letter to Palantir raising concerns about its contracts with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, DHS, for products and services for the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE. And it's in response, Palantir emphasized its contracts are only with the Criminal Div Investigative Division of ICE called Homeland Security Investigations, HSI, and that its software, quote, does not facilitate civil immigration enforcement by ICE's enforcement and removal operations, the ERO unit. However, this claim, according to Amnesty International, is absolutely inconsistent with other evidence indicating that Palantir's technology has been indeed used in this context, including U.S. government records, which the company continues to dispute. In 2017, ICE relied on Palantir technology to arrest parents and caregivers of unaccompanied children, leading to detentions and harming the children's welfare. Similarly, ICE has used Palantir technology to plan mass raids as well with raids that ICE carried out in Mississippi in August 2019, which led to the separation of children from their parents and caregivers, causing irreparable harm to families and communities. These raids, in turn, have led to cases of prolonged detention and deportation. Now, I'm sure my liberal colleagues have seen the horrific photos of children being held in cages uh, 
in these ICE detention centers. It is a human rights abuse of striking and terrible magnitude. The fact that Palantir is one of the companies that has been used to identify and break up these families, I find is very, very concerning. And yet, I find even equally concerning is that David McNaughton, who Francisco Sorbera at this committee said is a great Canadian, was shocked that we would even mention his name at this committee, uh, went and worked his way in through all the senior levels of the Liberal government to promote Palantir. And nobody raised questions. In fact, Mr. McNaughton, as far as I know, did not meet with Deputy Minister Friedland once. He met with her three times. She would have easily had time to check out uh, who she was meeting with. On March 2nd, 2020, he met with Rick Tice, the Director of Policy and Cabinet Affairs, right in the Prime Minister's office. Palantir invited into the Prime Minister's office. March 5th, met with Honorable Christy Friedland, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. March 6th, meeting with Honorable Christy Friedland, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. March 12th, meeting with Honorable Christy Friedland. I mean, is this how the Liberals do business? That all you have to do is hire a Liberal insider and you can take any company, any company that has the most horrific human rights abuses, and they'll walk right in and they'll be treated with total respect. And members of this committee will attack a member of parliament who raises questions about them for daring to raise questions about these great companies and the great Canadians involved with them. March 22nd, 2020, the Honorable Navdeep Baines, Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, arranged a meeting between individuals at Palantir and Public Service and Procurement Canada in connection with Palantir's offer of work. March 27, 2020, Ryan Dunn, Chief of Staff to the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, uh, was explained what Palantir was doing in other jurisdictions. So Mr. McNaughton was showing all the work that Palantir was doing in other countries. March 29, 2020, Leslie Church, Chief of Staff to the Minister of Public Services and Procurement Canada, meeting with David McNaughton. Now, Leslie Church, of course, uh, is the classic liberal who went from the liberals to work for Google and then was embedded into the uh, Department of Heritage, which was supposed to oversee Google. Needless to say, nobody's ever really done anything uh, holding Google to account. Uh, Leslie Church, I believe, is now in with Krista Friedland. So March 29th meets with David McNaughton. Oh, and the next day, March 30th, Leslie Church meeting with David McNaughton. Now, I want to point out that David McNaughton could have pretty much written the book on lobbying. He knows the lobbying industry. He's, uh, he probably knows the lobbying industry as well as the Kielberger brothers seem to do. And like the Kielbergers, he never bothered to register to lobby. But again, he's a liberal. He's a good friend. Who cares if the laws are being ignored here? And hey, he's representing this really great company called Palantir. April 1st, 2020. Jody Thomas, the Deputy Minister of Department of National Inf Defense. He reaches out to her to see what Palantir can do to help. April 5th, 2020, more correspondence with Jody Thomas, Deputy Minister of the Department of National Defense. May 1st, 2020, my God, David McNaughton is a busy boy. Uh, I think Palantir, I don't know what they paid him, but he sure is uh, giving them their money's worth. March. 30th, 2020, uh, Bill Matthews, Deputy Minister of Public Services and Procurement Canada. He's meeting with Palantir. April 3rd, 2020, Bill Matthews, the Deputy Minister of Public Services and Procurement Canada. Man, Palantir, I tell you, they have the all access pass to the Liberal government. All you got to do is buy somebody put them to work for you, someone who's really close to Justin Trudeau, and you, hey, Bob's your uncle. April 9th, 2020, Bill Matthews, Deputy Minister, Public Services and Procurement Canada, more meetings, to talk about the software that's available. And, you know, it's amazing. This is how they figured they were going to get around it. They, Palantir, this company known as the scariest company on earth, was going to give the Liberals 
their massive uh, data machine pro bono. They were going to help. They just want to help Canada. They were going to give it to them pro bono, and they figured that that was how they were going to evade the Lobbying Act. April 3rd, 2020, Simon Kennedy, Deputy Minister of Innovation, Science, and Economics, he's meeting to discuss the Palantir software. This is the software that they can track people. This is the software that's been accused of um, being involved in extrajudicial killings in the Middle East. Uh, the, a massive Palantir software that's taken children from their families and put them in cages. And then guess what happens? It all comes crashing down because I wrote to the Ethics Commissioner. And I asked the Ethics Commissioner, how is it possible that a former public office holder like David McNaughton could have ignored his legal obligations to register to lobby? And why is he meeting with Krista Friedland? Uh, we actually didn't know who he had met with at that point. We'd just known that he had met with Navdeep Baines. But then we see this massive pattern. And so the Ethics Commissioner has written an unprecedented report where he's barred. Christopher Friedland is not allowed to talk to David McNaughton for a year. Rick Tice is not allowed to talk to him for a year. Oh, and I'm, I forgot this. Uh, March 14th and March 30th, General Jonathan Vance, Chief of the Defense Staff of the Canadian Armed Forces, has been barred from talking to David McNaughton after having these meetings about getting Palantir's help on a pro bono basis, mind you, but getting Palantir's help when it was none of this was registered under the Lobbying Act. So now my liberals who friends who are going to tell us what, you know, these are great Canadians, these are great companies, I'm just being scurrilous, you know, just back off and and let us can let the liberals continue to filibuster. What really shocks me is that the so-called liberal values here is that you can take what may be one of the scariest companies on the planet, put a liberal in front of it, and the liberals will open the doors. And there's been no effort to maintain the law of the land in terms of the Lobbying Act and any questioning about why we would turn over sensitive data of Canadian to a company like Palantir. Now in the UK, at the same time, the Boris Johnson government gave Palantir the same kind of deal that the Liberal government was looking at getting them until we managed to expose this. And there was a huge backlash in the UK and they were saying, why in God's name would we give sensitive medical information to Palantir? Now, is it possible that Palantir would do anything nefarious with this? Oh, Certainly not, not according to the Liberals. These are good companies that are being needlessly attacked by the NDP. I would refer you to the article in Bloomberg, April 19th, 2018. Peter Thiel's data mining company is using war on terror tactics to track American citizens. And the scary thing, Palantir is desperate for new customers. Yeah, they're desperate. They were going to do anything. They were even going to give their technology for free to the liberals so that they could embed themselves in Canada. So I want to read to you from this because it shows you how insidious this technology is. So this is Bloomberg, April 19, 2018. High above the Hudson River in downtown New Jersey, Jersey City, a former U.S. Secret Service agent named Peter Cavicia III ran special ops for J.P. Morgan Chase & Company. His insider group, most large financial institutions have one, use computer algorithms to monitor bank employees ostensibly to protect against perfidious traders and other miscreants. Aided by as many as 120 forward deployed engineers from the data mining giant Palantir Technologies Inc., which JP Morgan engaged in 2009, Cavicia's group vacuumed up emails and browser histories GPS locations from company-issued smartphones, printer and download activity, and transcripts of digitally recorded phone conversations. Palantir software aggregated, searched, sorted, and analyzed these records, surfacing keywords and patterns of behavior that Cavecchia's team had flagged for potential abuse of corporate assets. Palantir's algorithm, for example, alerted the insider threat team when an employee started badging into work later than usual. Ooh, a sign of potential disgruntlement, 
that would trigger further scrutiny and possible physical surveillance after hours by bank security personnel. Now, over time, Cavicia himself went rogue. Former JP Morgan colleagues described the environment as Wall Street meets apocalypse now, with Cavicia's Colonel Kurtz in ensconced up river in his office suite, eight floors above the rest of the bank security team. People in the department were shocked that no one from the bank or Palantir set any real limits. It all ended when the bank's senior executives learned that they too were being watched. And what began as a promising marriage of big data and global finance descended into a spying scandal, the misadventures of which have never been reported. But it also marked an ominous turn for Palantir, one of the richest valued startups in Silicon Valley. An intelligence platform designed for the global war on terror was weaponized against ordinary Americans at home. <laughs> I, I read that and I just shudder to think that my liberal colleagues are obstructing our efforts to get answers from David McNaughton and Palantir. I shudder to think that this company that developed an intelligence platform for the global war on terror could be used to weaponize against ordinary citizens in North America. And yet they had this insider access. And we would never have found out if I hadn't contacted the ethics commissioner. So um, I think the other, another really telling story is um, the role that Palantir was used to attack uh, progressive groups and unions. Um, the, in the 2000, February 10th, 2011, I think Progress article the, on the US Chamber's lobbyists solicited hackers to sabotage unions and smear chamber political opponents. We find that Palantir was hired as part of a, comp, uh, a disinformation campaign to attack progressive uh, opponents in the United States. The proposal called for creating a, quote, false, false document, perhaps highlighting periodical financial information to give a progressive group opposing the Chamber of Commerce and then subsequently expose that document as a fake to undermine the credibility of the Chamber's opponents. In addition, the group proposed creating fake insider persona, persona to create, generate communications with change to win, uh, that they would feed fuel between feuding groups, disinformation, create messages around action to sabotage or discredit the opposing organization, submit fake documents, and then call out the error, create concerns over the security of the infrastructure, create exposure stories, and if the process is believed to be not secure, they are done. Cyber attacks against the infrastructure to get the data on document submitters to kill the project, since the servers now in Sweden and France are putting a team together to get access is more straightforward. A media campaign to push the radical and the reckless nature of groups like WikiWeeks and use sustained pressure. Now, this is really concerning because the idea of using disinformation tactics, we actually dealt with this just, I raised this last week uh, on why the Kielbergers had hired um, the group Firehose Strategies. Uh, the liberal attack group that does disinformation uh, campaigns and why they are tied into Israeli disinformation. Now, I, I know that that's, uh, you know, seems to be just a, a passing connection. But, you know, Ms. Latanzio uh, accused me of attacking a great Canadian charity for raising questions about why so much money that's supposed to be helping children was used to attack uh, and discredit potential political threats or journalists. But with Palantir being used uh, with their massive data machine to create organized disinformation to undermine WikiLeaks, undermine progressive groups, undermine labor unions is deeply concerning. Now, of course, Palantir has denied uh, their involvement in the, the Chamber of Commerce campaign. And of course, Palantir said that, you know, whoever was involved has been fired, but it shows the enormous power of a data giant that is up there with Google in terms of the amount of information it has on individual citizens. And that this is a company that came into Canada to set up contracts 
with the Canadian government that hired a close friend of Justin Trudeau uh, because of his contacts. And the Liberals let this company into all the top areas of decision making, very much like how the Kielbergers were able to walk in and $912 million later, they were walking out, Bob's your uncle, everything was great. That was of course until we started to say, hey, how did this deal go down? But what I think is really concerning, even more so than the things happened, is that we are now dealing with a deliberate obstruction campaign by my liberal colleagues to stop this committee from doing its job, to stop getting answers for the Canadian people, to be forced into a situation where we have to pretend that these things never happened because the ethics committee has been made functionally inoperable by the prime minister's office. I urge my colleagues to stop the obstruction and allow us to finish this report so that we can get the real information on how David McNaughton was able to work his way on the inside uh, corridors of power, promoting a company that to me is as frightening uh, and undemocratic and un-Canadian as Palantir. Thank you.